My parents were taught to be afraid that if I mingled with deaf children who didn't speak quite as well as I did, that I might lose my capacity to speak. There are a few bioethicists who've looked at me and I think it just doesn't compute that I could be a bioethicist and have a disability. There's still an underlying feeling that actually we'd be better off without disabilities and without people with disabilities. The process of research is never something that leads to a black or white answer. It's like an explosion of colour and light. It's kind of an ever-branching line of questioning and answering, constantly becoming more and more complex. At UNSW, I'm Professor of Bioethics, and at the same time, I'm Director of the Disability Innovation Institute at UNSW. A bioethicist is someone who's interested in the ethical, and that often sometimes means social, political, economic questions that are raised by new developments in medicine, um, life sciences in general. Bioethicists try to think through some of those questions. Quite often they're called upon to give some kind of input into policy or practitioner guidelines. I very much enjoyed watching Jackie become a, a world leader in her field, especially, I think, because she's not at all big-headed about it. Jackie's very well known internationally. Um, she is one of the leading disability bioethicists in the world, and, and, and she's probably the leading feminist disability bioethicist in the world. She can talk to the professional bioethics community, but also come over in incredibly down-to-earth language that anybody could understand. So I think she's an outstanding communicator. Both my parents were, they, they were the kind of people who would have benefited a lot from more education than they had. But they were both very bright, very probing, and they encouraged me to be like that as well. I can't remember a time when I wasn't reading. I, I could read before I went to school. I can remember when I was quite small thinking that it might be possible to actually know everything. My mother was also disabled. She was born with only one arm. I never saw her expose it. She was always very careful to keep it hidden because that was the culture at the time. I think her life was seriously damaged by that. My father's family was Anglo-Indian. I was conscious of coming from a mixed race background. I enjoyed the enrichment that having more than one culture gave to me. But I think my father and his family had it quite hard. I was eight years old when I became ill with what was diagnosed eventually as meningitis, meningococcal meningitis. That resulted in me losing my hearing. I'd lost all my hearing in, in my right ear. I no longer bothered with that ear at all, really. It's purely decorative. And in the left ear, I've got about 5% um, of my original hearing left. My parents were a bit at a loss. The advice that they were given was that probably it would be best not to expose me to music. The music lesson stopped and the piano got left behind when we moved house. So that was the end of my exposure to music, really. I wish they hadn't made that decision, but they followed the advice that they were given. It's really important that kids who have a hearing loss or kids who are deaf are exposed to music in some form because there's always something that you can get from music. I did go to a few you know, ballet lessons when I was little. In retrospect, it had a lot to do with being interested in different ways of communicating feeling and ideas. 
it's remained a major interest in my life. Certainly when I was a child, it was an intense drive to encouraging deaf children to learn how to speak in the first place and not to communicate using sign language of any kind or finger spelling. But I think it was a missed opportunity. It would have been an enrichment to be part of the hearing world and part of the deaf world and to be able to have learnt and acquired sign language as naturally as I could have done. I have been really lucky in the teachers I've encountered. There were teachers who made accommodations for me at a time when it wasn't standard. There was Helen Fowler when I was at primary school. And when I was at secondary school, there was a teacher called Debbie Plummer. She was the sort of pivotal person uh, in the class. They were not in competition with her. They were hugely supportive of her. She was a woman in science and she encouraged questions. And she was also somebody who had not only been to university, she'd been to Oxford. She made it seem possible for me to think that I could do that as well. I knew that Jackie was of the calibre to get straight into Oxford and I wanted her to have that chance. Going to university was an option for me, but I'd never imagined going to somewhere like Oxford or Cambridge. I was interviewed by the biochemistry tutor at Hartford College. There's a history of having sometimes disastrously low expectations of what people with disabilities can do. I went to the interview there more or less with the idea that this was going to be really good practice for other university ent entrance interviews that I might do, you know, the ones that I might actually get into. He asked me why I wanted to study biochemistry. I said, uh, because I like biology and chemistry. You could tell from the expression on his face that this was quite clearly the wrong answer. And he moved next immediately to what did I like to do outside of school. So I said I liked modern dance. And we had a 20-minute conversation about forms of communication that were nonverbal, about the connection between sign language and dance and gesture and so on. And it was a really interesting and, and nice conversation. It was in a physics lesson and my headmistress came in and started talking to my physics teacher at the front of the class and then they both turned and looked at me. They'd received a letter and the letter was my acceptance at, at Oxford to read biochemistry. At the end of four years, I'd finished my undergraduate degree, graduated, and the next step would be to do a PhD. I had been living in a graduate house, a shared house, on the grounds of the college, and Monica was the person who was moving into the room that I was leaving. So she came to have a look at her new room. On that first occasion, I wouldn't even let her into the room because I was looking after a friend's hamster. So I kept the door shut, and we kind of had this weird conversation uh, through a crack in the door about, you know, that big. And she moved into that room, and I moved into the room literally next door. So she was the girl next door. Do you know, I never did see the hamster. <laughs> we were sharing a, a big house, so we'd interact in the kitchen and meet and chat and so on. And I thought she was really interesting, and so I asked her out to the cinema, and she stood me up twice. You stood me up twice, woman. <laughs> I think I've often felt in my life not marginalised or marginal. I'd call it liminal, which is sort of on the edge of two things. Being mixed race, going to a fairly elite university, but not from an elite background, not really fitting into these places. If I'm pinned down, I think there probably is a meaning to life, and even if not, people need one. Ultimately, I found my way to the Quakers, the Religious Society of Friends, as they're called. Every church has its own jargon. Uh, the Quakers talk about holding in the light, with capital L. So the light is something to do with you know, 
the light of God, the light of the Spirit, however you want to think of it. And in the context of a meeting for worship, you, you are holding your thoughts in that light and hope to be guided so that you can discern what it is you're supposed to do or your opinion or make a decision. During my undergraduate degree in biochemistry, I did wonder at the end of my first year whether I'd made a big mistake. A lot of it I had not found particularly exciting. Then we started doing molecular biology and particularly genetics and molecular genetics that had excited me then and uh, when I was looking at what to pursue as a PhD. There were a few options that came up and one of them was a PhD at Cambridge working on the development of mammary cancer, tumours of the breast. The idea was to try to be able to identify the abnormal genes that were involved in particular steps along the pathway to a breast tumour. Nobody was going to do that kind of experiment on a human being. We were working on mice. It involved, first of all, developing what we called a viral vector, a kind of Trojan horse. What it does is infect, in this case, mouse cells. Scientists who work on something like cancer have a kind of quite divided attitude towards it, I think. You know it's an important thing to be working on. You also know that the whole process is so complex, it's highly, highly unlikely you're going to be the person to find, you know, the cure for cancer. What your work is going to be is like, you know, it's, it's a little cobblestone on a very, very long road towards that goal. There would be a particular pattern that I would see if I'd got the right vector. And I remember there was a particular evening when I'd been running the experiments during the day, and on this occasion, the pattern was exactly right. Kind of sat back in my chair and looked at it and said, hello, gorgeous, <laughs> because I was so pleased. So I got the PhD effectively on the basis of having constructed a functional viral vector and going through the rest of the experiments, even if it turned out to be a negative result, which is still a result. When we got talking about music, she always asked very interesting and intelligent questions. She didn't come with all the preconceptions that all my musical friends had. It made me look at music and how music works in a different way. I knew from the outset that she was a musician. When we realised that things were you know, pretty serious, I think I also realised that the, there was no future in this relationship unless I at least experienced something of music which was so important to her. I had listened to and enjoyed some of the um, pop and rock groups of the time, so I could hear them and I could enjoy them. I just felt that any other form of music that was maybe more complex uh, would be beyond me. I had a real barrier about my own um, inability. Since I've met Monica, I've been exposed to music again and given more, more self-confidence in, in the fact that I can enjoy it. The first concert I saw you in, uh, it was Zadok the Priest, and I remember just being incredibly re relieved, as well as enjoying it, but relieved that she was clearly very good and that I wouldn't have to try to think of something tactful afterwards to, to, to say to her. Monica and I got together in the middle of all the fear-mongering in the 1980s when the, the AIDS epidemic reversed a lot of progress for gay and lesbian rights. We had to be very careful who was aware of our relationship uh, and, and who was not. It was a weird time, actually, always sort of checking your pronouns. You know, if you're talking about my partner and I, never actually saying she. But I remember having piano lessons, even after we we exchanged rings and taking my, my ring off for piano lessons. I also remember the look that we got from the jeweler when we went and bought the rings and we were oh, buying Oh, a filthy ring. look. Yeah. Absolutely. I had already been offered a job as a postdoc in, in a place called Lausanne in Switzerland. And the reason I thought of going to Switzerland was because Monica, in fact, is half Swiss 
and she wanted to continue her conducting studies. When we moved to Switzerland, we knew that we were going to be in, in different cities and we still wanted to make a, a, a visible commitment to each other. So we had a private commitment ceremony, officiated, if you can call it that, by, by Debbie. Debbie had left teaching and become a minister, uh, an ordained uh, minister. It wasn't possible for it to be in the church building because the Church of England didn't marry gay people or lesbian people. But I, I could see absolutely no reason why it couldn't happen on church property in the vicarage. We actually sat in a circle in Debbie's house, and so like it was... Quakers. Yeah, which is what Quakers do. So it was pretty much a Quaker meeting in that there was a lot of silence, and then um, people read things, and Debbie kind of began and then did it. Many years later, in 2008, it had become possible in Switzerland to have um, a civil partnership registered officially. So on the 4th of April, 2008, we were able to go to the, the city hall in Basel, in Switzerland, where we were living, and you know have this done officially. I, I really struggled on a uh, you know, on a more social level, living in Lausanne. And the main reason for that is that I at least found French very, very hard to lip read. Accessibility is, it, it's, it's quite patchwork and quite varied. In one country, television captioning will be non-existent, for example, whereas something else will be really well provided for, and other countries vice versa. There was a fellowship that was being offered by the Quakers in, in Britain uh, called the jo Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust Fellowship. These fellowships were awarded to um, Quakers who would offer some kind of um, educational activity or training activity. So I offered to do workshops and lectures around the, uh, the ethical issues to do with genetic engineering. But that introduced me for the first time really to um, public engagement activities and also to people's questions about the ethical significance of the kind of science that I was doing. It was working with Quaker groups in, in England that um, drew me in more into public engagement and then eventually into, into bioethics. I then had the very good luck to meet Christoph Raymond Sutter, uh, who's now one of Switzerland's best known bioethicists. He was a philosopher moving into bioethics and he didn't have a science background. I was a scientist moving into bioethics without a philosophy background. So it was a kind of match made in heaven, really. Christoph and I joined forces. We got a grant from the Swiss National Research Fund and we set up the first interdisciplinary unit for bioethics in Switzerland. Bioethics is a, is a branch of applied philosophy, so we have to engage with the world and find out what's really happening so that we can inform the arguments and try and make better decisions. Part of what's happened in bioethics is what's called the empirical term, where people are actually doing research, bioethicists are doing research with members of the public, for example. So you find out a lot more valuable information about what people think. And Jackie was one of the pioneers doing, doing this, meeting with groups of people in the context of a formal research project. Asking us to discuss what connection that... I'm classed as a, an empirical bioethicist. There's still quite a strong tradition in, in bioethics of being very, very theoretical. I think theory is very important, but you need to have some idea of the everyday realities to work your theory on. Disabilities can't have a good life. It's unusual to have a bioethicist who's disabled. I have encountered some bioethics colleagues who just seem to find it quite difficult to cope with me because I'm a person with a disability and they're not used to seeing peers and colleagues as disabled. I felt that it's been more of an advantage than a disadvantage to be able to bring that experience into my bioethical thinking and also into bioethics you know, in, in general. There's a long-standing tension uh, between the world of bioethics and the disability world. Bioethics can be criticised for oversimplifying a lot of things, and one of them is disability. And I think it centres on what's seen uh, by 
a lot of people with disability as bioethics defense of uh, eugenic ideas. I suspect that there's still an underlying feeling that actually we'd be better off without them, without disabilities and without people with disabilities. I think that's unfortunate because bioethics needs to know more about disability in order to do its job better. Ultimately, I was invited by the, by the Quakers in England, by the Religious Society of Friends, to give the Swarthmore Lecture in 2002. The Swarthmore Lecture is the most prestigious uh, piece of speaking and writing that, that the, the Quakers do annually, and she was asked to deliver it. And, and the words playing in the presence uh, were the words that Jackie used for the title of her Swarthmore lecture. Science, for her, has been playing in the presence of God all her life. I'd been working with ideas about disability in bioethics for some time, and gradually realising that I felt that there was an approach to disability in bioethics that was lacking. And I wanted to introduce the idea of what I call disability bioethics, which was starting a bioethical exploration from a starting point of the perspective of people with disability. Uh, uh, thankful and uh, grateful for. I don't think anybody else, at least at that time, was doing anything similar. Also, family is also important to me and also friends. In the early summer of 2015, I felt quite tired, quite run down, and I thought I had a you know, summer cold or flu, something like that. It was the following weekend. I, I had to go uh, away for a meeting and returned on the Saturday. And on Sunday, Monica said to me, you've, you've gone yellow. So we decided we'd better get this checked out. I was fairly convinced that we were making a big fuss about nothing in particular. The medical team's reaction on seeing my blood results suggested that something was actually quite, you know, quite wrong, and I was admitted to hospital. I'd had a viral infection, which for some reason had um, really badly affected my liver. I think I had been there for about a week when somebody first mentioned the idea that uh, I might ultimately need a transplant, a liver transplant. Well, the news that she needed a transplant was shocking. It wasn't surprising at that point, I have to say, because I knew pretty much she was dying because she was, she was going into sort of multiple organ failure. I remember sort of looking at my pee and seeing that it was dark green, it was the colour of spinach. I'm thinking quite objectively, um, that means my kidneys are packing up too and I'm going into organ failure. And I knew I, knew I was dying. It's very churning up when you're faced with a, a, a very co close friend who may not survive. I just had to be real and I just said, I don't want you to die. Uh, and she said, I don't want to die either. And I just handed everything over to the God who I believe is a healer. And then I blessed her. I remember being wheeled down and looking at something like a, an air duct on the wall of the room before you go into the theatre. And then the next thing I knew, I was looking at the air duct again. The, the surgery had been you know, successful. It's always going to be a mixed thing because neither of us is ever going to forget that in order for her to survive, someone else's family lost a loved one. In 2017, I was elected to a fellowship of the Academy of Social Sciences uh, in, in, in the UK. The fellowship was a recognition of her outstanding contributions to the field, and I think it's not, a, it's not an honour that many people get. 
It's a mark of esteem to be elected to be a fellow. You can't just apply. For most of them, you have to be nominated by someone, so other people have to think you're good. And Jackie's a fellow of two, acad two royal academies, not only the um, Academy of Social Sciences, but also the Academy of Arts. So the arts form will be recognising her contributions via her philosophical bioethics work, and the social science form will be recognising her contributions through the empirical work. It, it's one of the two occasions in my life when I've received a letter that I was quite sure had been misdirected to somebody else called Jackie Beach Gully. I had been at Newcastle University for 13 years. I was director of the Policy, Ethics and Life Sciences Research Centre. I didn't see myself moving. And then I was approached by UNSW to see whether I'd be interested in heading up um, the new institute that they were planning to open, um, Disability Innovation Institute at UNSW. There have been one or two academics with disability who have been influential on me, but very, very few. We're quite rare. I think that's a, that's a real problem. I would like to think that younger academics, younger students can look further up the ladder and see professionals with whom they can identify. They can see themselves in those positions. Definitely earlier on in my career, I wouldn't have mentioned that I was deaf. If I'd make an application, I certainly wouldn't mention it at all. If I got to as far as interview, it would be, you know, I, I have a little problem with hearing. I mean, I certainly don't do that now. In part, that's to do with becoming just more established and more confident in your profession. It's also a change externally. It's the way that society has changed to become more accepting of diversity and of people with disability um, as well. I think it's been really exciting to watch the journey that Jackie's taken from molecular biology through to bioethics. You know, we, we've been together for 33 years. Both of us are quite stubborn and decided we wanted this to work. So whatever difficulties we have had, we've worked through them. That's why we're still together. One thing I often get asked is, if you could take a pill now uh, and have your hearing back, have your disability removed, you, know, you would have it, wouldn't you? I'm, I'm honest in saying that actually, no, I wouldn't. I've been deaf long enough that I manage my deafness and my life perfectly well in order to have the life that I want. I've gained a lot from the things that come along with disability. It is me, it's part of my identity. 